To be honest, without the Friday classes, I begin to forget what the keyboard shortcuts are that I've set up. So it is Wednesday again, and we are doing financial markets microstructure. Last week, we talked about bubbles in financial markets, and we looked at two different families of models. Firstly, we looked at models of herding. We used the model of Smith and Sorensen as our workhorse example to illustrate the main intuition. And then we also looked um, at a few other variations on the topic uh, using the survey of Diction, Danny and Charm. And the main idea behind those herding models is that public information can quite often outweigh traders' private signals. So if, private in if public information is informative enough, it can lead to traders ignoring their private signals just because private signals are not enough to outweigh any kind of information conveyed through public information. So public information can be strong enough for all traders to base their decisions on it rather than on the private signals, but at the same time, public information may be imprecise enough so that it's actually incorrect. And so we can have situations in which all agents are using the same few pieces of public information to um, to base their decisions upon, but these decisions end up being incorrect in terms of the underlying state of the world. So we have a herd, and it is incorrect. Another model that we've looked at uh, last time was that by Abru and Brunemeyer, and that was more explicitly a theory of bubbles. So if herding was more an idea of how these herds can arise, which eventually lead into bubbles. Uh, Abru and Brunermeyer build an explicit theory of bubbles. And our discussion of this paper circled back to our discussion of uh, Condor model, because they built on the same building pieces, notably lack of common knowledge and higher order expectations. So in this model, we had a bubble that uh, started growing at some unknown point in time and was set to burst at some point in time. But traders who get to learn about the existing mispricing, about the fact that current market price deviates from market fundamentals, from the, sorry, from the fundamental value of the asset, they need not act on this information immediately because they are not sure what other traders are thinking about this mispricing of whether other traders are aware of this mispricing. And so even when uh, sufficient, even if sufficiently many traders are aware of the mispricing to burst the bubble, they all might have sufficiently strong incentives to actually write the bubble and try to game the system. And this would proliferate the bubble and so it would burst due to exogenous reasons rather than due to endogenous market correction. So this was last week, and today we will be talking about auction models. So uh, if you remember the, as usual, the very first lecture, the richest source of content in our course, because I just keep coming back to it. Um, when we talked about market institutions, we outlined three main ways in which trade can be organized. So we had dealer markets, where we have a central dealer or market maker, who process basically all the orders, and that's how most markets used to be um, in the previous century. And these days, most markets are uh, organized in terms of limit order book. So we had a couple of continuous auction uh, models, models of continuous markets uh, with limit order books. So these were Gloston model and Parler model. Their traders arrived at uh, the market sequentially and they submitted their orders sequentially, but uh, effectively this w there was no batching. Traders, uh, orders were not batched together 
uh, to be executed uh, in, in, in packs. But this is also uh, something that happens. So the call auction format does exist. It is used in some markets. For example, the electricity market, I believe, uses call auctions to clear the market. And under this format, just to remind you, you have some time period over which orders are accumulated in limit order book. And then once the time comes, they are all crossed against one another. So uh, all profitable trades are cleared at some uniform price. And this letter format, the call auction format, is the one that we have not really talked much about. So we had Kyle model, which had this kind of uh, batching to some extent, where orders from informed traders were explicitly pulled with orders from uninformed traders. But this model was still uh, dealer-centric. So it, it was still more about how dealer behaves, not about how traders behave. Although we had that to some extent as well. So today we will try to amend that and take a closer look at these call auctions. And we will use the very classical instrument of auction models. Now this um, class of models, this field, is uh, very prominent in economics in general. So you can see it in many, many different applications. And uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not super specific to financial markets. So I'm not aware of a lot of the literature which crosses, which explores questions that are specifically relevant to financial markets organization using these auction models. But that is partly just because these auction models are so good, they are so universal, that you do not even need to um, modify them that much for them to work in the context of financial markets. Now, uh, we will do a quick introduction to that literature using some of the most relevant models, most relevant to our settings. And uh, auction theory in general is yeah, one of the big successes, one of the, I'm not sure if I should say first, but it might be one of the first big successes of uh, game theory, of the more modern approach to economic analysis, as it was developed in the um, late 70s, early 80s. And, um, well, the field was most active in the last century, in the 1900s. But it is still an active field of research to these days. So a lot of people are writing about auctions, a lot of people are exploring all the various combinations of auctions because there are just so many possibilities there. There are so many different variations that you cannot quite explore them all. Uh, auctions of the field are most typically associated with the two applications. So one is contextual ad auctions, which is when you're looking for, when you're Googling something on the internet, you have, um, you have those ads. So let me try to maybe show you with disabled ad block. So if you would Google nope. let me try again. No, damn it. Sorry, I tried to Google something in another window, but I don't get any ads. But the point is when you uh, Google something in Google or another search engine, you do get some sponsored ads right before you get the search results, unless you're using an ad blocker. And so to show you these, the search engine actually runs the auction really, really quickly. So between the moment you press enter and the moment uh, you get the results. So it pulls all of the possible bids from all the advertisers who, are, who, are, who would be interested in this uh, search. It runs the auction among them, and it decides which of these ads to show you. So this is one of the very popular applications of uh, auction theory. Another popular application is spectrum auctions, which is when um, mobile operators are bidding to get the rights to use specific frequencies, radio frequencies, in order to provide services. 
So 3G, 4G, all required a new set of frequencies. So there were spectrum auctions all around the world uh, where governments were selling rights to these frequencies to different mobile providers in their countries. Now, I feel like privatizations would also be a relevant application for auction theory, although there are not too many of those going on. So we'll skip that. And speaking of financial markets, if you just look at limit order book, what you see is pretty much an auction, right? You don't even need to stretch your imagination. You have different traders who are submitting their bids to get the asset or to sell the asset. So with no stretch of imagination, that is quite literally an auction. So this is something very relevant. And today I will just present you the general framework in which you can think about these auction models. So the main point of these models is to capture the imperfect competition between traders, between bidders, in the presence of finite number of agents in the market. So once you have an infinite number of agents, you basically reduce to competitive equilibrium, Walrasian equilibrium, that you, that you study in micro one. But a lot of the discussion that we had in financial markets course is that not all traders are present in the market at all times. So if you take any given point in time, you will only have a limited number of traders in the market. And so this imperfect competition between these traders is probably an important aspect to capture. <clears throat> and so then you can take these models that we will see today and you can apply them to study uh, basically the exact same questions that we did with Gloston Milgram model, which has been our workhorse for the most of the for the most of the course. You can study what are the prices in the markets, what are the trading volumes in the markets, are market allocations efficient, are prices efficient, how do prices respond to different factors such as uh, transparency, such as market fragmentation, and so on and on and on and on. So a lot of different things you can do with these models that we are not actually doing in this course. So there is a huge variety, as I said, of auction types that you can consider in general. So first of all, there is a huge variety of formats. So you can have sealed bid, where uh, bidders cannot see what everyone else bid, or you can have an open bid, which is uh, like a trading floor in which everyone can hear what bids everyone else shouted at each other. You can have first, second and um, other price auction, meaning that the, the winner of the auction can pay their own price in the first price auction. They can pay the second highest price in the second price auction. And you can generalize it uh, onwards. You can have auctions in which only winner pays or all traders pay their bids. Which, are some, uh, which is relevant for some applications. Now, apart from formats, uh, you can think of situations in which there is symmetric or asymmetric information, in which traders have their private signals or they all trade based on the same information. And here, even with symmetric information, you get some interesting equilibria, but we will not look there. Now, you can have private or common valuations. So with private valuations, all traders have uh, their own idiosyncratic values for the asset, which are not correlated with one another. Or you can have common value auctions in which everyone would have the same value of the auction if they had the same information, but they have different pieces of information about this common value. Now you can have auctions for one unit or many units, and financial markets are mostly a multi-unit auction. Right, because many, many units of asset are traded at any given time. Uh, in the model, you can have single or double-sided auctions. So single-sided is an auction where you have an auctioneer, one seller, and potential buyers are bidding to buy this. In case of double auction, both buyers are bidding for the highest price, and sellers are also engaging in this bidding war. So both buyers are competing with one another and the sellers are competing with one another. So there are bidding happening on both sides of the market. Now you can have known or unknown number of bidders, you can have symmetric or asymmetric bidders, 
So there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of possible variations. So you, and you can combine these assumptions in any different ways. So that's why probably auction theory was such a rich field, just because you have so many different variations on the models. Today, we will look at some combinations of these models. So with, we will start with the simplest ones, and we will then move in the direction of a couple ones that are more relevant for our uh, applications in financial markets. I will mostly follow a uh, great textbook by Vijay Krishna on auction theory. This is like a holy bible of auction theory. And if you're interested in the topic, uh, that's the first way you should the first place you should look for any further information on the topic. But I will also use one other paper to talk about double auctions. So we will start with one of the simplest possible models that you can have which is a private value first price auction. So the setup is as follows. There is one item for sale, just one unit of the stock for our purposes. There are n potential buyers, bidders, and each of them has a private valuation XI. So here these valuations do not are not correlated across different traders. Meaning, however I value, the asset is completely independent of how you value this asset. So we will assume that these private relations are symmetric, so they are independently and identically distributed across bidders. And we'll say that these private relations uh, have bounded support, so they take values uh, between zero and x bar. Now the format of the auction is such that everyone simultaneously submits uh, a bid, BI, and partly what this means is that when I submit my bid, I do not get to see what everyone else bid for the asset. So this is a sealed bid auction. But then once this happened, uh, once all bids are submitted, the highest bid is drawn, it is said to win the auction, the winner pays their bid, so it's a first price auction, and the rest pay nothing, so it's a winner pay auction, not an all pay auction. And uh, we're dealing with the rational agents in the simplest possible way, so they just maximize expected profit and they are risk neutral, so their utility is linear in money meaning that their expected profit is given by uh, this function pi of their bid and their private valuation. So the profit that they receive if they win the asset is x minus b. They get the asset that is worth x, they pay b to get it. And they win with this probability. So they only win if their bid, bi, is greater than all the other bids of all other agents in the market. So obviously this is a very simple expected profit, and this probability is where all of the action will be happening. Basically, if you look at this profit function closely, you'll see immediately what the main trade-off for the agent is when the agent is selecting which bid BI to submit. So now that this BI enters in two places, in the profit and the winning probability. So submitting a higher bid will mean that I, on the one hand, get less if I win, because I'll have to pay more, because I bid more. But on the other hand, it means that I will win the auction with higher probability. And so the optimal bid, the I, will balance uh, these two directions optimally. So the first line is what I just said. And the way we will solve this model is we will look for symmetric equilibrium, which is only natural because we assume that our traders are symmetric, meaning that we will think that they are all using the same bidding strategy uh, given by some beta of x. So my bid, when my uh, private valuation is x, is given by beta of x. And the way we will uh, solve the model is we will first 
suppose that we will choose some agent i we will suppose that all other agents use some strategy beta of x and we will make some assumptions on it that it's strictly increasing so the higher is my value valuation the more i bid then in this setting where agent i assumes that everyone else is using beta of x we will find the optimal bid for agent i bi of xi and then we will have a fixed point problem so in symmetric equilibrium it must be that the two functions coincide the bi of xi must be exactly this equilibrium strategy so we'll have this fixed point fixed point problem with respect to beta and that will be the hardest part so first a uh, few preliminary steps we can already rule out some of the possible bids in particular uh, recall that private signals x were between 0 and x bar and the bidding strategy is strictly increasing in x meaning that there is a maximal bid that you can expect from your opponent and it's given by this beta of x bar you know that none of your opponents will never bid above beta of x bar so it is also never really profitable for you to bid above beta of x bar because you lose money if you win you have to pay more but this does not increase your probability of winning so any bid strictly above beta of x bar is strictly dominated by bidding exactly beta of x bar and on the other end uh, given that the minimal possible private value is zero we can already learn what the uh, what this agent would bid what the agent would bid if uh, their private valuation was zero and it's trivial that uh, if you don't value the asset at all conditional on winning you would not be willing to pay anything for this asset meaning that the agent whose private valuation is zero uh, has a weakly dominant strategy to bid zero and either lose or win and get the useless asset for zero price kind of a um, not a very meaningful trade-off but an easy choice so we know that all bids will lie uh, all bids bi will lie strictly between zero and beta of x bar now let's get to the more interesting part so we will work a lot with this object y1 which is the maximal signal among your opponents so given that we assumed that bidding strategies are monotone this y1 is the bid is the person is the valuation of the person who would have won the auction if you decided to bid zero if agent i decided to bid zero So we know the distribution of x's of private valuations which means that we by just using some uh, probability theory magic we can derive the distribution of this y1 because it will just be the maximum of n minus 1 independent uh, variables iad variables x xj so we can derive its distribution and let's say that uh, capital g is the CDF the cumulative distribution function of this distribution and small g is the PDF of this distribution the probability density function okay using this new notation we can rewrite layer i's expected profit given some bit b and valuation x so x minus b is still the same uh, profit conditional on winning and we can rewrite the probability of winning as this object so let's uh, take a second and see how exactly this happens so we are interested in the probability that bid i is greater than max of um, 
all other bids. You win the asset if your bid BI is greater than uh, bids of all other players. Now this is the same as saying that your bid BI is greater than beta of that Y1. Because we know that Y1 is the guy who would have won the auction without you. This is the highest bidder among all other, all other traders. And this trader's valuation is Y1. And so according to our assumption, he uses a strategy beta. So he bids beta of Y1. And so now we know what the distribution of Y1 is. So we just need to transform this probability to the probability of Y1 greater or uh, less than something. And we can do that by just taking um, the inverse function of beta of both sides of this inequality. So this is equal to the probability of y1. I'm also flipping left and, left and right hand sides here. Um, sorry, less than or equal to beta to the power minus 1 of bi. So this is the inverse function of beta, meaning for any bid it gives you the valuation of a person that would have bid like this. And so just the notation, with the notation we had, this would be exactly g of beta minus 1 of bi. So this is the mechanical way to derive it. The intuitive way is, uh, by, is to say that by bidding bi, you win if the highest valuation of the, comp if the valuation of the uh, strongest competitor is below the valuation of the type that bids bi. Once again, you win if your bid bi is greater. Sorry, if your if y1, the highest valuation of the competitor, is lower than the valuation of type that bids bi according to the strategy beta. So this is just a slightly different representation of what we had. But once you uh, write profit function in this way, you already have a function of b in terms of some well-defined functions. So what we do when we want to maximize a function, we take the first order condition, we take the first derivative. So we take the first derivative of this profit function with respect to b, this bid is our variable of choice. And what we end up with is uh, this expression here. Now we have two ways in which b enters here. This and this. Derivative with respect to this entry is uh, pretty simple, right? This is uh, this last term here. And to get the derivative with respect to this entrance of b, we can use the chain rule. So we go here. We want to find derivative with respect to b of this probability. By using chain rule, it is equal to uh, the sum, no, sorry, not the sum. So you first take derivative of the outermost function, which will just be the derivative of the CDF, capital G, is the PDF, so small g. And then you multiply it by the derivative of the inside function. So you have derivative with respect to b of this thing. Now this might be the one and only place I've ever encountered the derivative of the inverse function ever since uh, we studied this in high school. 
But the idea here is that it's very simple. So this, this derivative is kind of um, same as derivative of valuation with respect to bid according to this uh, bidding function beta. Right? So this beta minus 1 of b is the, again, the valuation of the type of bids b according to bidding strategy beta. And you want to find the how this valuation changes with b. So this is, in a sense, this dx over db. And you can write this as the inverse of how the equilibrium bid changes with the valuation. So this will be just equal to 1 over the inverse of the derivative of beta at that point. So the, the idea here is that derivative of the inverse is the inverse of the derivative. Now there's also a small trick as to what you put in the brackets here. So you want to estimate this derivative beta prime at kind of this point which you had here, but recall that beta itself is a function of x, is, it's a function of valuations, so you need to plug, you need to have a valuation in here, so you need to have this whole beta minus 1 of b in there. And so if you do all this, you will end up with exactly this expression. So no rocket science, but it requires invoking some obscure knowledge. So we did this, this is our first story condition, and this gives us the optimal bid in terms of the valuation x and the bidding strategy of everyone else. Now what we know about equilibrium is that b and beta should be the same, right? That was our equilibrium condition. We want to find a symmetric equilibrium in which everyone bids the same thing. So b of x should be given to beta. It should be equal to beta of x. And once we recall that, once we plug in beta, b equal to beta of x in that expression that we had, it reduces to almost a digestible form. So you will end up with no b left. You will end up with a condition on beta, on the equilibrium strategy. And this equilibrium strategy beta will depend basically on the distribution of the private values. Now the only problem is that it's a differential equation, equation which also requires invoking some of the uh, well-forgotten math knowledge. But if you blow the dust off your dif differential equation textbooks, you will find out how to solve it, and you solve it, and you end up with the expression for an equilibrium strategy. So this differential equation is solvable in closed form, and you also have the initial condition of, with beta of 0 equal to 0. So you also have no uncertain coefficients left. And the takeaway is that this equilibrium strategy will be equal to this. Expectation of y1, given that y1 smaller than x. So the idea here is that your bid should win against the strongest, com uh, strongest competitor, but only barely. So if you bid much more than that, then you are overpaying. You have won anyway, but you are paying too much. If you are bidding less than this, then a competitor with valuation y1 would want to outbid you, would want to bid more aggressively. So our equilibrium strategy falls apart. And so for this guy with valuation y1 to not be willing to bid more aggressively, he should know that um, by trying to outbid you with valuation x, he'll, he will not win.
Now, just uh, let's quickly look at a very simple example of that. So let's suppose that we have um, XIs that are distributed uniformly on 0, 1. The simplest distribution I know. Come on, the continuous one. So the CDF of this distribution is uh, just X, right? The CDF is the probability that the random variable is smaller than this value in the brackets, X. And the probability that Xi is smaller than some value is exactly that value. Now, can you tell me what G of X will be here? So G of X, to remind you, is the probability that the maxim maximal valuation of the opponent is below some X. Equivalently, it is the probability that the maximum of n minus 1 independent variables distributed like this is smaller than some value x. I'll give you a few seconds to think. And we have a winner. This is exactly right. So g of x will be equal the probability that the maximal that the maximum of n minus one IAD random variables is smaller than some x is just equal to the product of the probabilities that any single one of those variables is smaller than x. So this is just f of x to the power n minus one, and we have x to the power n minus one. So the answer is exactly correct. And Matilda gets 10 points. So then if you use this distribution and go through all the steps that we just did, including solving the differential equation, uh, you will arrive to the equilibrium strategy, which looks like this. So a person whose private valuation is x will bid just under x. They will shade their bid by a little bit in order to get some positive surplus in case they win, but also to have a significant chance of winning. Now, one thing to note here is that this degree of shading is decreasing in n. So the larger is n, the closer this coefficient is to 1. And this reflects the competitiveness of the market. So when n is close to infinity, when you have infinitely many buyers in the market, you realize that bidding, tr trying to shade your bid will decrease your winning probability drastically. So your winning probability would be very sensitive to, um, to your bid. So shading your probability, be shading your bid becomes very risky and you're not willing to do that. So you do not shade your bid by much in case n is very large. While if n is, for example, 2, you have one other competitor, you know that they have a decent probability of having a low valuation x. So if you try to shade your bid to decrease it from your actual valuation x, you will not lose that much in terms of winning probability. But you will gain a lot in terms of uh, saving on payments. And this is probably the main takeaway that we can make from the first price auction. So bids are uh, shaded compared to valuation because traders want to have some profit. And the degree of shading does depend on the number of um, players, on the number of bidders. Now in our setting, once again, the point was that bidders are not perfectly competitive, that there's only a finite number of them, and so they get positive profits. 
And another factor that went into these positive profits is that um, there is some asymmetric information in the market. All traders are uncertain of what other traders' valuations are. And so this is probably not even so much a factor in getting positive profits as it is a factor in um, having kind of smooth equilibrium strategies, having these monotone um, bidding strategies beta, which are smoothly increasing in X. Whereas, for example, in um, full information case, if you look at Bertrand model with, with, um, with different cost levels, you would get that bidding strategies there are very kind of sharp. Never mind, I'm not sure what I mean by that, what I want to say by that. But one thing to point out here is that even though we have asymmetric information in the model, we have no adverse selection. Because this asymmetric information only concerns uh, the player's idiosyncratic valuations for the asset. So my information about my valuation is not relevant for you, for your valuation uh, of the asset. So we do not have any kind of adverse selection here in this simple model. And another small takeaway is that uh, the derivation that we have here really depends a lot on the belief about the distribution of others' valuations, xj. But if you go back to all the other models we've considered, it's kind of the case everywhere. So you have some kinds of expectations everywhere, so your beliefs about the distributions matter a lot everywhere. Okay, so this was one of the simplest models of auctions that you can think of. First price, private value auction, or private value first price auction. This is not the most fitting model for our purposes. This is not immediately relevant to financial markets, and we'll go through some of the factors that distinguish it. But the reason I went through it in such excruciating detail, so as to give you the derivative of the inverse function, is that this approach is pretty universal. So for any auction model you have, you basically follow the same main steps. And you will see this when we look at other formats. The sum of the details will be different, and the hardest part is figuring out what details are different, but the overall logic is pretty much similar. Okay, so what, why was this not a perfect model for us? Firstly, we had um, sealed bids. So when I was making a bid, I could not observe everyone else's bids. And this might be the case in some of the real-world markets that operate in call auctions, but it might not necessarily be the case in others. So in, some, in many markets, you can imagine that traders get to observe the limit order book when they are submitting their bids. So they get to observe all the bids submitted to this point. One way you can excuse from that is to say that, well, you know, everyone just submits their bids at the deadline. So if, if we do a call auction every hour, then the limit order book is just empty for all of the hour, and then at the very last second, everyone submits their bids. In that case, it would be the exactly same, se uh, the exactly same setting environment. But you can also look at some of the other... Uh, auction format. For example, for the longest time when I was hearing auction, my first association was the English auction, where you basically have a trading floor and traders are shouting prices uh, they are willing to pay for, for the item. 50, 60, 65, so on. That's the kind of auction that you see in movies. Alternatively, you can have an auctioneer just saying, you know, 50 in the third row, 60 in the, th in the second row. Do we have a 65, 61, 62, 63? So that's, that's the English auction. It's called ascending price auction as well. And what you can show is that this English auction is exactly payoff equivalent to the first price auction that we just looked at. So all players get exactly the same expected payoffs. 
uh, the outcomes are still efficient, which is something that I did not mention, but I should have. Outcomes in our first price auction are efficient in the sense that the highest, the person with the highest private valuation gets the item. So the item goes to whoever values it the most, which is what we want to see in the real market. Now English auction will give you the same outcome, it will give you the same expected payoff, so it's not much different from the first price auction. Uh, the same is the case with the Dutch auction, which is like the English auction, but it has a descending price. Meaning that uh, there is a clock, and the price is gradually going down, and the first one to say, I'm willing to buy at that price get the item. This is also a format that is uh, sometimes used in, in non-financial markets but in um, commodity markets. And this is also payoff and also strategy equivalent to the first price auction that we just saw. Now these two, the English and the Dutch auction, are two kind of formats that you can think of with observable bids. It is still more about um, continuous auctions rather than call auctions. But I just wanted to point out that everything is more or less the same, at least in the case of independent private value setting. But is this the right, is this the right setting? Is private values the right setting? The way we look at the financial markets for most of this course is that the asset has some fundamental value that everyone would agree upon. So maybe common values is the way to go. And we will look at a common value model now and we will see once again that it is not that much different. But this is not the only, uh, not the only scene we've made. So we looked at single unit, single side auction. So we had one item for sale and the seller was uh, just a the auctioneer. The, sell the seller was not bidding for the item. And we will look at a double auction later today, closer towards the end of the lecture. And we will once again see that it's not that much different, although double auctions differ in one important respect. And if you look at multi-unit auctions, where many units of the item are sold uh, at the same time. Again, if you look at one-sided auctions, these are almost equivalent to what we just saw, especially when all of these uh, units are homogeneous. So it's not like you have um, a used car auction where there are five used cars and if you don't buy this, you can buy the next one, but they are different. Right? In financial markets, all of the units are homogeneous. So you do not care who you buy from, you do not care which exactly serial number of the stock will be that you buy. Um, so this simplifies this auction a lot. And in our case, profits are quite typically linear in quantity, which simplifies things even further. So in this financial market context, the multi-unit auctions will be almost equivalent to what we saw. The only difference now will be that, assuming that everyone is still bidding for one unit of the asset, which is questionable, but let's stick with that. So if everyone is bidding for one unit of the asset, you want to buy one stock, you no longer need to outbid everyone. You no longer need to outbid all of your competitors. If anything, you don't want to do so, because that will be too expensive. You want to be as close to losing as possible while you're still winning. Meaning if you have K items, you want to buy the last item that was for sale. So you want to be the Kth highest bid. And you want to be the Kth highest bidder of the opponents rather than the first highest bid of the opponents. Which means that, you know, those Y function uh, will be not the maximum but the kth highest bid of the opponents and the distribution functions will have to be computed accordingly but otherwise the approach is exactly equivalent. So the point of this slide is 
you have a lot of leeway here. You have a lot of extensions that you can consider, and we will look at some of them. And the general approach to solving the problem is more or less the same. So this is the framework that you can use for your auctions, for all of your auction needs. Now, so what we'll do in the second part of this lecture is we will first look at common value first price auction. Then we will take a second to look at second price auction. Uh, just to illustrate a point about the common value first price auction. And then we will spend about five minutes on double auctions. But now it is time for our legally mandated break. If you have any questions about what we've done so far, especially first price private value auction, or any of the discussions surrounding it, you are most welcome to ask them during the break or just after. But we will be back right after these messages.